And here you can see, in 1898, we've been looking at just this image, this very faint ghostly image for all of these centuries. That's all we could see. And in 1898, they take the world's first photograph of the shroud, and Segunda Pia, the world's first photographer, goes into his dark room. He's got his negative glass plate in his hands. His hands start to shake. He almost drops it to the ground. Why? On the negative plate, he believes he's the first man to gaze upon the face of the beaten Christ since the apostles themselves. What Segunda Pia realized in 1898 is we've been looking at a photographic negative all of these centuries that becomes a positive to the camera's eye on the negative plate. That is a miracle. Did the world recognize it? What did Segunda Pia get for this incredible discovery? Wine, women, song, fame, fortune. He became a televangelist. No. They ridiculed him. They consider him a fraud, a fake. You're actually looking at Giuseppe Henri's 1931 photographs of the shroud. He was able to recreate Segunda Pia's experiments. Please understand the shroud is never out for display every day. So from 1898 to 1931, you could not see the cloth. And in 1898, Segunda Pia did this alone. In 1931, Giuseppe Henri, the leading photographer of Italy, had nine scientists in the room with him to verify he had done nothing outside the photographic process to go from the negative to the positive the camera captures on the negative plate. Segunda Pia was 76 years old, sitting in the room with them at the time when he was exonerated. Hmm, how interesting. Now, things will begin to heat up later on as science begins to look at this cloth, but I'm going to jump ahead to 1973. In 1973, Dr. Max Frey, the founder and director of the Swiss Criminal Investigation Laboratory in Zurich, Switzerland, and the man who investigated Doug Hamishall's death for Interpol, will discover as he's looking at the shroud, verifying photographs, color photographs that are being taken of the cloth, he, as a trained botanist, sees pollens all over this cloth. And he discovers this pollen. This is pollen from a thornbush plant that only grows in Palestine. And this, this is the most prevalent pollen found on the cloth. Dr. Yuri Baruch will tell you from the Israeli Antiquities Authority that about one third of all the pollens found on this cloth come from a thornbush plant that only grows in Palestine. But don't let that bother you. The critics have already told you the shroud is woven in the Middle Ages. Carbon-14 has proven it. So what we have is some forger in the Middle Ages who went to Jerusalem, got his hands on some thornbush pollen, put it all over the shroud, then quickly ran to Spain to get his hands on the sudario. Don't ask me how he did that. That doesn't matter. He put the same thornbush pollen on that as well. And his name was Oh, you mean they never have a name for you, do they? There's never a name for this person who figured this all out and fooled 20th century science. No. This thornbush pollen is extremely important. You can see it's starting to get spikes in it. These spikes will be maturing to two to three inches. Dr. Deneen has cut a piece of the thornbush which still grows in Israel today, and you can see how vicious those spikes are. So we know for a fact, Jesus of Nazareth did not have a crown of thorns. That's wrong. He didn't have a crown of thorns. He had a cap of thorns. And that cap of thorns was extremely vicious. And here, Monsignor Ritchie, who was very close to the shroud, will show you, based on the thorn bush that we know that grows today, what the cap of thorns looks like. This is the cap of thorns. And as you can see, it's a vicious cap. They believe that if the Roman soldiers would have tried to fashion this around Jesus' head, they would have lacerated their hands. So it's believed that the Roman soldiers probably whacked it into his skull with their swords and then tied it to his head. You could not, you could not withstand the passion of Christ. You could not withstand it. It is not the gospel of success. It is the gospel of passion. Passion. And he expects us all to take up our cross and follow him. When the children in the center see this, they begin to understand what Jesus has accomplished for us. None of us could have made it to the cross just based on this alone. You and I would have fainted, fallen down, not made it at all. Now, this is a computer enhancement of the blood stains from the crown of thorns, and you can see how it's dripping all over his face. And that gives you an idea of why Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus would want to use that face cloth to capture that blood before it flows, as, flows into the ground. Now, in 1976, Dr. John Jackson, I told you, he was the one that the Pope was going to meet with in 1981. Here he is in 1976. He's a captain in the United States Air Force. He's teaching physics to the U.S. Air Force Academy students in Colorado Springs. 
He has a doctorate in physics. This is his partner, Dr. Eric Jumper, also a captain in the US Air Force. They know about Max Frey's work, and they have access to the VP-8 image analyzer. The VP-8 image analyzer was invented to measure the mountains of Mars for NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Phil Schumacher invented that camera, and Phil Schumacher was with them when they made an amazing discovery. They decided to take a simple black and white photograph of the shroud and put it through the VP-8. Kind of as, you know, what's going to happen if we do that? If I took a picture of any of you and put you through the VP-8, you're going to come out two-dimensional, flat, and distorted. If I took a picture of the Mona Lisa, she's going to come out flat, two-dimensional, and distorted. There's nothing in a normal photograph to give the VP-8 this type of information that the Shroud of Turin gives it. What does the Shroud of Turin give it? Three-dimensional information. The Shroud of Turin has three-dimensional information encoded in the cloth for a camera that was invented in 1972. And Phil Schumacher has written many papers. The last one I read was in the year 2000. And Phil Schumacher had this to say. No matter what I do, no matter what experiments I try, nothing but the Shroud of Turin gives me the three-dimensionality that I find in the VP image analyzer that I invented. And he ended his paper with this word, these words. Therefore, I understand the Shroud of Turin is the burial cloth of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those aren't my words. You can imagine I'm paraphrasing the man, but that's the gist of his comments. And so you can see this incredible three-dimensional information. As a result of this, Jackson and Jumper petitioned the Catholic Church to mount what is called the Shroud of Turin Research Project. And in 1978, the cloth was brought out by the church to celebrate its 400th anniversary of its first appearance in Turin, Italy. Three and a half million people will honor and venerate the cloth in St. John the Baptist Cathedral. And for any of those of the Protestant brothers and sisters we may have who don't understand the word veneration, that does not mean worship. It means honor. You take a picture of your grandfather, he's dead. You put it on your fireplace mantle. You pass it by, you say, Grandpa, what a great guy you were. I remember you. What great times we had. And the same is true for images and icons of Jesus and Mary and the saints, their remembrances. And so after that exhibition, for five and a half intensive days, 40 scientists from around the world will be allowed to examine the cloth. The only caveat from the church is don't do any destructive testing. Here's Dr. Jackson heading up the team. Here's Dr. Max Frey back from his 1973 visit. He's so intrigued, he's back to see more of the cloth. This is Don Lin, one of our friends who just passed away last year. At this time, he is in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's photographic department of the management staff. My point to you is these guys aren't Tom at the gas station. Tom at the gas station knows his cars. These guys are space age scientists. And they examine the cloth. And after 150,000 laboratory hours, this is what their report said. We don't know. We don't know how the image got there. We can't explain it. We can tell you the image is not made of paint, pigment, or any man-made substances. Now we're up to 650,000 hours. And the report is the same. 